Well, let's stick with tech, but go a little bit broader with David Bonson. He is chief investment officer for the Bonson Group, which has about $5 billion in assets under management. David, I'm glad you're with us because I'm taking a look at your notes and I see this line. Another year of a select few mega cap tech companies driving all of the stock market's return is completely off the table for 2024. Tell us about that conviction. Well, I go back and look at 1999, where it happened. You look at 2020 into 21, and the way in which things followed after that. When you get this top heavy, it doesn't have to be technology. It just happens to be that way now and in these other year examples. The, the follow-up generally doesn't allow for it to persist. And in fact, the reversion to the mean can be quite significant. What you hope for bullishly is the reversion of the mean comes from a rising tide lifting all the other boats. We had a lot of that in November and December. You had a more uh, democratization of market gains. But the other way it can happen, of course, is by some of these valuations re-rating lower. So, David, do you see tech necessarily falling from here? Are you just saying that, okay, maybe it's not posting the uh, extreme double-digit gains that we saw, but uh, rather you see other boats start to rise? Uh, I think that I do believe that they will fall, but I don't have a high conviction in that because popularity stocks like this become impossible to market time. And because I don't own the names, I don't want to be sitting here rooting against them. I just think from a valuation standpoint, it's an asymmetrical risk and reward. I think there is a far better chance of a larger downside than a higher chance, uh, which is really a smaller upside. And, and it also has to be said, not all of these things are created equal. You know, the valuations of Google are different than the valuations of NVIDIA and so forth. As a space, though, I think that they are collectively overpriced, and yet overpriced stocks go higher all the time. But my view would be that there's just better opportunity elsewhere. Right. You may not own these Magnificent Seven stocks, but plenty of other people do. And in fact, plenty of people are overexposed to the big tech names. What portion of investors do you think that represents, those who are overexposed to big tech names as they perhaps tried to wind down some of those positions. Well, first of all, we know it's almost everybody because so many are index investors. And if you're in a cap-weighted index, you're overexposed. And that's really the big problem, is that you get a self-fulfilling prophecy of upward momentum in a good market because the cap-weighted index indices, which is trillions upon trillions of dollars, have to be buyers of those positions. But then when markets come lower, you, uh, that whole dynamic reverses. So I think people are exposed in individual stock prices portfolios excessively to these names, but even if they just hold the S&P 500, the weighting of those seven names being higher than the entire market cap of Canada, United Kingdom, and Japan put together, those seven names being four times the market cap of the Russell 2000 all put together, that's just totally unsustainable. Yeah. All right. I want to shift gears a little bit here and talk about the macro economy and get your sense of what um, inflation looks looks like given the cooler than expected producer price report we did get today, which uh, is a little bit of a contrast to what we saw when it came to consumer prices um, earlier. So what do you think is the relationship here between consumer prices and producer prices? Does PPI lead CPI? How should we think about that? Well, PPI certainly leads CPI, and we know that just in terms of the historical reality of how goods that become processed and then become uh, available, unless all of a sudden you're having a consumer recession that puts downward pressure, uh, the consumer prices are always going to follow producer prices. But the reality is that the produ- the consumer index wasn't overly hot, in my opinion. You, uh, there may have been an expectation of 0.2 and it was 0.3. There's a rounding error of math in there. But even then, it's still showing the shelter CPI of somewhere near 7%, and that's just utterly ridiculous in real time. The lag effect of rents is not yet sinking in to reflect the reality on the ground that might be closer to 2 to 3% in, in real rent growth year over year, meaning the actual CPI number has a two-handle now. The PPI has been at basically 0% inflation for some time with intermediate processed goods in outright deflation. 
And so when you think about how the markets received that and processed that information, uh, it's translated into pretty aggressive rate cut pricing. And that really is one of the rallying cries of equity bulls and tech bulls at this juncture, that basically you're going to have the Fed cut, what, six times in 2024. Weigh that against what you're expecting on the earnings front. And who wins that battle when you think about the positive uh, news that might come from the Fed? My contrarian view is that the market ultimately is not really uh, responding to four rate cuts, five rate cuts, six rate cuts. The traders are responding. There's a lot of front running of the Fed as will it be March, will it be May, will they end up at three, four or five? And those things will matter to traders. I certainly expect day to day volatility. That Powell press conference factor has certainly created two, three days of, of volatility. But no, I believe ultimately on the year and into next year, markets are weighing mechanisms of earnings, not Fed press conferences. And I absolutely believe that uh, markets are priced for 11% earnings growth year over year. Mm -hmm. They're expecting 11 to 12% earnings growth next year. And the idea of getting an upside surprise from that is very unlikely. So you're at a high valuation as an index investor with a high expectation of earnings growth. And sure, it could reach those expectations. Does it outperform it? I'd be skeptical. Mm -hmm. I really think this is a stock pickers market in 2024, and it's probably going to be more value oriented than growth. All right. So a, a lot of people need to do a lot of homework here. As we get started on this earnings season, David, what um, surprise are you going to be looking for um, from the companies that will be reporting results? You know, what's interesting is uh, the only name that reported this morning that we own is J.P. Morgan, is the greatest dividend growth investor in the banking system. And and you saw it drop 4% pre-market, and a half hour later, it was up 2% pre-market. It opened today in a positive. It's now come back around flat. That's what I expect in earnings season is a lot of volatility intraday around some of the names because of the big rally they've had. J.P. Morgan was up 30% last year in a year where most of the banks made no money at all. I mean, it was a very challenging year in the banking sector. So these names might have already had gains in Q4 of 2023 that impacts how we respond to things in this coming earnings season. Uh, But companies reporting on margins, pricing power, forward guidance, that's definitely what we're going to be looking for this earnings season. All right, David, always enjoy speaking with you. That is David Bonson of the Bonson Group. Have a great weekend.